<clears throat> well, you're welcome to church, and it's good to have you in the house of God. I trust that you've had a fabulous week in this Ghana. Amen. We serve a God who is above every limitation of life. Uh, just to let you know that uh, we are entering the zone. We are entering the zone in this week. And on Thursday, we start 40 days of power. So get ready. Uh, it's going to be powerful. And we start, we're going to have a service here Thursday night. I will be opening and uh, launching the 40 days of power. And you are all invited. Well, you're not just invited. You must be here. <laughs> I'm inviting as if you are strangers. You must be here. So Thursday, we are opening 40 days of power here. Well, today is Father's Day, and uh, we want to take time to honor all the men and the women uh, for the, right, like, the roles that they play in our lives. Um, it's not easy to be a man. Uh, to be a man is very hard. Um, I know that women will say the same, but I'm not a woman, so I can only speak for men. It's a tough job. Uh, to be a man and to be a father uh, in, in this time. Fathers are protectors and providers, and they come to us in different shapes and forms. They come as parents, they come as uncles, as brothers, older brothers, teachers, stepfathers, guardians, spiritual fathers, and mentors. They come in different shapes, but each one of us uh, have benefited at one point or the other from a father figure. Uh, could be your own biological father, or it could be somebody else who's stood in for you, an uncle, a cousin, uh, somebody in the church, uh, or somebody in the neighborhood who stood in for you and set an example for you and became an encouragement to you. Each one of us, at some point in our lives, have had somebody play that role. And um, our fathers affect us in very profound ways, for better or for worse. Uh, first of all, they transmit their genes to us. Uh, and so at conception, whether you like it or not, uh, your father passed on some substances to you, uh, some chromosomes that worked into your genes and predisposed you to many things, to your height, to uh, certain habits you're going to have, to the shape of your, uh, of your head, uh, the hair you will have, the eye color you will have. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes some diseases that may affect you in the future, all of these imparted uh, by your father. And so uh, whether you like it or not, uh, they affect you uh, genetically. Um, um, even if you hate them, and sometimes you hate them, but you look like them. Uh, <laughs> you know, so um, fathers affect us genetically, um, and, and they, they put their names on us. And uh, I'm not called Otabel because I chose to be Otabel, because that's my father's name. Uh, and my children were called Otabel, you know, they had no choice in that. Uh, fathers give us their names, and uh, we carry their names, whatever that name means. Whether it means uh, somebody who must be beaten or somebody who must be encouraged. Uh, but we carry their names. Uh, some people don't carry their father's name because the man probably didn't take responsibility uh, for them, so their mothers named them differently. But uh, for those who carry their father's name, and for those men who give their names to children, it's an awesome responsibility to put your name on somebody. It carries everything that the person, or everything that you have. Uh, the fathers influence the homes that we live in. Uh, they become our examples. They determine the outcomes of our lives in a very, very profound ways. Um, people have wondered uh, why you know, mothers sometimes get a good deal better than the fathers. Uh, when it's Mother's Day, the whole world stops. Uh, when it's uh, Father's Day, it's almost as if there's a comma and uh, 
uh, after that, you know, everybody moves on. Fathers don't get to be appreciated very much. Uh, sometimes uh, their role is not appreciated. And, and th there are several reasons, but I, I think generally women have a head start or mothers have a head start over fathers. Um, they have an advantage. It's worked into the biology. Uh, a, ma a woman becomes pregnant. Man men don't become pregnant. Um, and and for when a woman becomes pregnant, instantly they become aware that a child is developing inside them. So at a very early age, uh, in that process, they become aware of this person inside them. They get up in the morning, they are vomiting uh, or not, depending on their constitution. Uh, and all kinds of things are happening. They're feeling hot and their body is expanding. All of these changes make them aware something is happening inside them. As the child grows, they feel his presence or her presence. They're kicking. They put their hands on the tummy, sometimes pray for the child, and all of that. Now, this goes on for nine months. And so, she is present, very much aware of this child, and the man is not aware. He may watch it, but doesn't feel it. So you find that the bonding of women to their children starts very early and is deeper than the men. And then the whole process of birth goes through uh, a painful process that women uh, don't forget. And just the pain itself makes you value the child. Uh, and then you start with breastfeeding. All of that is bonding. And remember, all of this that is... I'm not talking to you women. I'm talking to men. <laughs> now, all of this is going on without the man. Now, it's not the man's fault that he didn't get pregnant. It's not his fault that he can't breastfeed. It's just that that is how he is. So... By the time the man comes into the life of the church, so of the, of the child, so much has already happened. And then when he starts to take interest in the child, the mother is also always pulling the child to herself, pulling the child, pulling the child. So uh, it's not for nothing that women bond with their children better than men. It's not the men's fault. It's just the way God shaped us. Men's roles take place later. They now have to seek to provide for the child and protect the child. But all of this comes later. And, and sometimes the adjustment a man has to make to be a good father is a very difficult adjustment. And I just want to encourage the women, please help your husbands to get close to the children and please don't draw them too much to yourself that your husbands feel like outsiders because it is already difficult that we are coming in last after all the nine months that you have had to born we are now trying to come in to know this child and feel his presence and 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 get to know him and sometimes some men do it well, others don't do it well, and, and detach from their children, they don't become responsible, uh, and so on and so forth. But please don't blame them too hard. It's biology. It's biology. Does that mean we should just be irresponsible? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just trying to explain why sometimes it's difficult for the men to be as close to their children as the women are. Because there is a process that makes the women bond better however no matter what it is this is what life is and when we come into life as men we know that one day uh, by God's grace we will be fathers and and we have to play our role and so today I'm going to talk about uh, that and and so uh, you remember when I was, it was Mother's Day I spoke uh, I spoke about spiritual mothers and so today just to balance the equation I'm also talking about spiritual fathers. So, you know, the women will not say I cheated them. The men will not say I cheated them. They're all spiritual. And uh, when I spoke about the, uh, the women, I gave four examples of spiritual mothers. And I'm going to give four examples of spiritual fathers. Just, I'm a fair pastor. I just give four, four. 
everybody gets their paid. So we're going to go into the scripture and see some example of fathers in the Bible and the lessons we can learn from them. The first we want to look at today is a very obvious choice and that is Abraham. Abraham is a father. He's a, he's a father whose faith uh, is our example. So Abraham is an example of a father's faith. Christian fathers must influence the faith of their children. We must influence the faith of our children. And Abraham tells us how to do that. Romans chapter 4 from verse 13 to 21 uh, is an account of Abraham's faith. Now much of Abraham's life, as you know, happened in the book of Genesis. But Romans gives us a perspective on him and the role of his faith. Romans chapter 4, verse 13 to 21. I will not read from verse 13. I will start reading from verse 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope in hope believed that he might become the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. A few things to learn about Abraham. First is that he lived out his faith publicly. Abraham's walk with God was public. All the people around him saw his walk with God. His wife saw it. His nephew Lot saw it. His servants saw it. They saw his faith out there. If we're going to be Christian fathers, one of the things we have to do is to let our faith be seen. Our faith must be public. You can't say, well, I worship God in my heart and, and it's a private matter. No, if you are a father and you are a Christian, your faith must be demonstrated. Your faith must be publicly seen. Abraham's faith was publicly seen seen he demonstrated it they, they saw him make sacrifices they saw him walk with God they saw him obey God he narrated to them what God had taught him he narrated his encounters with God even with his servants Abraham lived out his faith publicly as a matter of fact it was for this reason that God chose Abraham because he says Abraham can be trusted to teach others what he has learned. Abraham lived out his faith publicly. Fathers, live out your faith publicly. Let your children see it. Let your nephews see it. Let your cousins see it. Let people around you see that you are for Christ Jesus. Live out your faith publicly. Second thing about Abraham is that he won over his own struggles. He won over the battles of his struggles. Abraham had battles to fight. He had a fight. When God called Abraham, he promised him that he was going to have a child. Abraham spent almost all his life waiting for that promise to become real. And for years and years and years, he fought that battle of faith. And the Bible says he didn't waver. He didn't relent. He trusted God. But that was a battle. How that promise was going to be fulfilled seemed to be impossible. Because he kept growing older and older and older and older and older. Still struggling to get a child. Not just any child, but a child from Sarah. He tried to get a child from Hagar. God says, that's not it. It's going to come from Sarah. 
And he, as he watched Sarah, Sarah was getting older and older. The Bible says her womb was dead. That is not a, a fully biological description, but it just means that she didn't seem to have the capacity to have a child. Abraham himself was old. The deadness of his own body. Everything practical showed he couldn't win this battle. But he had to stay to win the battle. Now as men, each one of us have battles to fight. For Abraham, it was for a child. For you, the battle you are fighting as a man, as a father, may not be for a child. It may be a battle to win over alcoholism. You drink. And you need to conquer alcoholism. And sometimes it looks like, oh, you've conquered it. And then you go back to it. And for years, you're stuck with that problem. For some people, the battle they have to fight is not just a battle for a child, for a child, but for, against adultery. Because they are just messing up. And they need to fight that battle and win it. Because if you don't win your battles, your children are going to fight those battles. If you don't win your battles, your children are going to come and fight what you should have won. Instead of standing on victory ground, they stand on the losing ground. And Abraham says, I got to make sure that my child of promise is born so that my descendants and God's purposes are fulfilled in my life. I'm here to challenge every man here. You have to fight your battles and you have to win your battles. You have to win those battles. For some of you, it's a battle against gambling. Some is a battle against polygamy. Because everybody in your family has children from different sources. From your grandfather to your father to uncles, everybody. Nobody has one, one set of children from only one woman. It has become a battle you must win. And you must win it so that the descendants coming after you will not fight that battle. And that was Abraham's challenge. So even when he was 99 years old, he had to continue fighting. Because if I don't win this battle, Isaac will not be born. If Isaac is not born, Jacob will not be born. If Jacob is not born, there's no Israel. If Israel is no Israel, there's no David. If there's no David, there's no Jesus. I have to win this battle because sometimes the battle seems to be personal to you but it's not personal it is destiny so much is tied into you winning that, that battle and I just want to encourage you some of you need to win a battle over alcohol and maybe you've tried and tried and you don't seem to be winning it but don't give up the fight you have to fight until you can win that battle. Don't go to your grave with your problems still hanging on your head. For some, it's a battle of poverty. You have to win the battle of poverty. Poverty has been chasing you for too long. And as a man, as a father, you must win it for your children. Every African, one way or the other, is fighting a battle of poverty. Every one of us. Every one of us. Because we, we, poverty is very close to us. If you go to almost every, even the richest African today, go three generations, you end up in a village. Poor. Because we haven't come out from village for long. If you, are not, you were not in the village, your father was. If your father was not, your grandfather was. If your grandfather is not, your great-grandfather. By the time you go to the third and fourth generation, we are all in a hut somewhere. So each one of us is trying to carve out a better life for our future and for our children. And for some of us, the struggle is hard. You start this, it doesn't work. You start a job, it doesn't work. You get fired from your job. You try to start a business and it collapses. And you look at life and you say, it's too hard. My friend, that's life. It's hard, but it's doable. 
And if you are a man, you don't give up and say it's hard. I was going to say that women can say that, but these days you can't say all of these things that women can say. But I'll say it though. The women can say, well, life is too hard. I will give up. Fine. But a man cannot give up. A man cannot say life is too hard because you are the protector of the family. You must win your battles. Every man here say, I will win my battles. Whatever that battle is, you have to win it. Abraham had to win his battles so that Isaac can be born. He won over his battles and he left a legacy of faith for us to follow. Fathers are legacy givers. Our children and others who look up to us use our victories as the platform on which they rise to their own destiny. Today, Abraham's victory is the platform for me. So that when life is hard, I can say, look at Abraham. He fought and won his battle. It's now my legacy. He's my father. The Bible calls him the father of faith. Do you know the number of people who depend on your victory? All the men listen to me. Do you know the number of people who depend on your victory? You may not even see them. You may not know them. They may not even have been born. When Abraham was struggling, I wasn't born. But thousands of years later, his victory is essential for me. What if he had lost? You have no idea who depends on you. Not just your children, but so many people, even those yet to be born, are waiting for you to succeed in order for them to come into this world. If you fail, they will not come into this world. If you fail, they will not have an opportunity. If you fail, life will not be good for them. Look at all the people who had to win the battles of life for us to have the life that we have so they can leave a legacy for us. Abraham tells us that we can be fathers of faith and we can fight and we can overcome our battles and we can leave a legacy for others to follow. The second father we want to look at, quite an obvious one, is Joseph. The foster father of Jesus. He talks, he represents a father's protection. Fathers are protectors. Although sometimes some threaten their own families. But fathers are protectors. A father's protection is a source of great comfort. Matthew chapter 2 from verse 13 to 15. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. And was there unto the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Joseph learned to partner with God for God's will to be done. He yielded his life to God. He chose to side with God. Joseph was God's partner. He heard from God. To protect the child. It's amazing when you read the gospels to know that both Mary and Joseph heard from God. Mary heard from God to tell her she's going to have the child Jesus. But when the child was in danger, God didn't speak to Mary. He spoke to Joseph. Both are hearing from God. But they have different assignments. Mary is bringing the child into the world. Joseph is making sure this child doesn't die. That's a protector. When you are a father, you become a partner with God to protect your children. To keep them safe. And to ensure that their destinies are not aborted. That they become the men and women that God has called them to be. May God give you the strength to be a Joseph. For your children not to be destroyed before their time. Joseph partnered with God. 
Many times we only see Mary as the one who partnered with God and who said, Lord, according to your word, let it be done to me. But Joseph also partnered with God. He worked with God. Joseph protected his family's honor. Joseph is described as a just man who did not want to disgrace his wife. He understood the impact of reputations. He knew the value of preserving honor. He was a father who was ready to forgo his own honor so that his wife's honor and that of a child could be protected. Mary is found with child. The Bible says Joseph being a just man did not want to disgrace her. She says I'm going to protect this girl. I'm going to protect her name. I'm going to make sure people don't mistreat her. Even if I'm not going to marry her, I will not destroy her. I'm protecting her and the child she's carrying. He's a protector of dignity. Not just a physical protector, but protector of dignity. And that is a charge for us as men. That we must protect the honor of our families. And especially for those of us who are married, we must protect the honor of our wives. You must protect the honor of your wives. And you must protect them even if you are not happy with them. It is not right for a man to negatively talk about his wife to anybody. Especially to complain to another woman about how bad your wife is. And how she doesn't cook for you well. And how she doesn't help me well. And how my life is so miserable. Of all the women in the world, that's one of the one you chose. It's a manifestation of your wisdom. There are men who complain about their wife's food. I'm, I'm not saying a wife shouldn't cook well, you know, but you have to eat what's on the table. That's what marriage is all about. When you say I do, it means I'll eat. You eat what's on the table. Years ago, I was talking to a man who was complaining about his wife. And he was livid. He said, Pastor, do you, can you believe it? I go and work hard. I work hard in the, the whole day. And I come home. And can you imagine, Pastor? I'm telling you. Can you imagine jollof, uh, rice and stew? Rice and stew. Pastor, is that how to treat a man? <laughs> now you can uh, imagine the tribe he is from. You know, rice and stew. And I said, what's, right? what's wrong with rice and stew? He said, Pastor, how can I come after hard days where I can eat rice and stew? <laughs> you know, for those of you who are not Ghanaians, there are certain people in Ghana that only one element is food. All others do not qualify. And I'm not going to go into details. <laughs> so he's hungry. Can you imagine? I said, but that is food. He said, no, that's not food. I'm the man. <laughs> I must get the right carbohydrates. <laughs> yeah, you may not like what she cooks for you, but should you tell somebody else? Yeah, you may not like her, her behavior, but should you go and disgrace her? Joseph says, I'm not going to disgrace this girl. I'm going to marry her. She's with child. At this point, I don't know where it's from, but I won't disgrace her until an angel spoke to her and says, it's okay. This is God. But his original intention, even when he didn't know it was God, was I will not disgrace her. It's honor. It's dignity. And we have to learn to honor the women that God gives to us. I know sometimes as a man it's difficult because we've, we've had bad examples as fathers. 
for so long that mistreating women comes naturally to us. But Joseph says, I'm not going to do that. He's an ancient man. You can say, well, maybe there were no human rights then, there was no feminine then, there was, but common sense is common sense and good heart is good heart. You don't need laws to be a good person. He says, I'm not going to. I'm going to treat her well and I'm going to treat the child she brings into marriage well. Because sometimes you marry women and they bring a child into the marriage. That's what Mary did. She brought the child into the marriage. Now, all of us now spiritually, he's the son of God and so on and so forth. But if you look at it from a natural point of view, it's not, it wasn't easy. But she say, he says, I'm going to take care of this boy like mine. I'm a carpenter. I'm going to teach him to be a carpenter too. That's the best I can do. And I'm going to make sure that this boy is protected and his mom is protected. I don't understand everything going on now, but I respect this woman. I love her and I protect her. That is a man's job. You don't go disgracing your wife. Now, I'm not a perfect man. I'm not perfect in any way. I've been married for over 32 years and I've never, ever, ever complained about my wife to anybody. Not even to our children. I don't go and say, you know, your mom, your mom is like this. No, no, no. No. If you're Joseph, you protect your Mary. You may not understand everything, but you protect her. That's part of being a man. Being a father. You can't just love the children. You must love the woman who suffered for those children to be born. And you must love her through all the changing seasons of life. Whatever that means. And Joseph protected his son, Jesus, from destruction. When the angel spoke to him and said, hey, there is danger, he protected Jesus. Fathers, when there are warning signals about your son, take it seriously. Joseph acted with urgency. Woke up the next morning, took the family out. Protected his wife and son until a safe period. Now, sometimes as fathers, we see warning signals, but we don't take them seriously. Somebody comes and tells you something about your child. Oh, your son is doing this, your daughter is doing that. And sometimes we rush to defend our children. It's good to defend your children, but be very careful that you don't avoid or you don't ignore a warning signal. Because bad behavior in later life always shows up in warning. Somebody says, uh, your, your, your son or your daughter insulted me in public. Don't just jump to your son's defense because that disrespect is beginning to manifest itself. Take the warning signals well. Fathers, take it well. Doesn't mean you go and, as our fathers used to do, every, they, you come from out, outside and they hear that you've disrespected somebody, they don't even want to hear what you have to say. You just come to the, hey, come, 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 come. Gives you the lashes you suppose. Pa, 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 pa. What happened? <laughs> what happened? Please, I didn't do anything. You didn't do anything. Come again. Pa, 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 pa. Tell me the truth. It's the truth, sir. They didn't give us a chance. <laughs> but we are better fathers than our fathers. We are better fathers than our fathers. They, they, did, they didn't know any better. Their fathers were different fathers. And, and, and they didn't know any better. But we know better. And after you know better, you don't have an excuse to be like your father if he was a bad father. Because he didn't know any better. But you know any better because your pastor is called Pastor Mensah Otabel and you know better. You know better. You know better. 
I've been teaching these things. They say, I never heard. I've said it, I've said it, I've said it. You've heard. You have to be better. I have to be better. Joseph protected his son from destruction. Third father, Elijah. He represents a father who imparts ability, gifts, grace to his children. His story is in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9 to 15, and I'm not going to read it. Elijah poured what he had into Elisha. He spent 20 years training, guiding, mentoring Elisha. Took him along, encouraged him. A father must impart what they know to their children. If you don't have biological children, impart what you know to somebody else. Joseph imparted his skills to Jesus, although that was not a biological son. Elijah imparted what he knew to Elisha, although that's not a biological son. He poured what he had into Elisha. We must be fathers who impart what we have to our children. He allowed Elisha to dream big. One of the most audacious verses in scripture is when Elisha asked Elijah for a double portion of the spirit that was in him. How are you going to behave if your son comes and says, I'm going to be greater than you? I must say for the record that the fathers of today are very different from the fathers of yesterday. The fathers of maybe 60 years ago and so on didn't take it easy for their children to want to be better. They saw it as arrogance. They saw it as pride. Elisha says, I want a double portion of what you have. That's a bold and audacious demand. But Elijah didn't get offended. But this goes beyond birth fathers. It also goes to people who are leaders. That we must be comfortable for people who are coming after us to be greater than us. Definitely, I want the next general overseer of ICGC to be far greater than I am. And to do far more than I've ever done. Because 50, 60 years down the line, I don't want people to talk to the generation of pastors of ICGC and say, oh, in the days of Otabel, things were powerful and things were great. No. I want them to be able to say, oh, I wish Otabel and his generation would be alive today to see what you are doing. We cannot be a generation that praises the past without any future. That's a battle of diminishing returns. We can be a nation, for example, in Ghana, where we praise the past. Oh, Kwame Nkrumah was great. And then we cannot say the same of anybody else. We should be able to say Nkrumah was great. The next one was greater. 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 And we have better leadership now than before. Because that is the only way we make progress. It's when one generation becomes greater than the previous one. Elisha says, I want a double portion of what is on you. I wish that young men and women in this house would say, I want to be ten times greater than Pastor Otabel. In whatever way that ten times interprets. Because when we grow old, we want to look back and see people doing what we couldn't do. And people going where we couldn't go. And achieving what we couldn't achieve. That is the greatest way to honor anybody. To do better than them. And that's what Elisha said. I want a double portion of what you have. Listen to me. No matter what you have. If you are a head usher. And somebody says I want to be a greater usher than you. Don't be angry. If you are head intercessor and somebody says, I want a greater ministry than you, don't be angry. If you are the head of worship and somebody says, I want to be better than you, don't be angry. If a, in fact, there was a pastor who told me that he, he didn't want to be greater than me. He's actually greater than me now. 
Yeah, he, you know, the kinds of things people tell us. He sat in front of me directly and said, he said that I was his John the Baptist. He's Jesus, I'm John the Baptist. I said, oh, wow. I didn't know that. Elijah, Elijah didn't get offended because somebody wanted to be greater than him. He showed Elijah how to achieve greatness. He says, okay, you want to have a double portion? These are the rules. Listen to me, if you want to be greater than me, that's good, but it's not going to come on a silver platter. It's not going to come by saying it. It's going to come by paying double the price I have paid. Because if you see me standing here, I didn't just materialize it. You're just there one day, whoo, there I am. Oh. You know, people sometimes people say, oh, look at all these pastors. They have thousands, as if thousands were born with us. Oh, they are just there and thousands came now. I used to be a village preacher. I used to go in villages. I used to walk in the rain, in the sun, preaching, interceding, walking, traveling all over, preaching. You were not there. You didn't see it. But now you see a very refined, erudite, eloquent. <laughs> eloquent preacher. He said, oh, I want to be like Pastor Otterbell. I want to be able to be expressive. And I want to speak English so beautifully. And I want to be able to do that. Go to the village. <laughs> because... What you see in manifestation was birthed from a place. And that's why Elijah had to take Elisha to the places he had been to. He says, if you want a double portion, you have to go learn to be in Bethel. You have to be in Gilgal. You have to be in Jordan. You, you have to go through this process. Then you'll get to where the double portion is. It's good to dream big sons and daughters. But you have to work for the big dream. Don't talk it. Pay the price for it. Work hard for it. If you know what it is to be where some of us are, you would see that just the honor, so-called, is nothing compared to the pressure. Pressure. Under pressure. <laughs> pressure. You have to learn to handle pressure and stand still. I will never forget years ago I was preaching in Oda and it was in the evening it had rained and there were flying ants, insects all around. And for some reason a demon possessed ant just before I started preaching went into my clothes. I was wearing three pieces. And this thing decided, the Lord has blessed it with full meal and started chomping and biting me. At a point, I thought there were many of them. It was going up and down, bite and grab, and going to all, biting, biting, biting. And I started preaching and this thing is biting me. And everything in my head says, cut the preaching short. I said, no, I'm not going to cut a preaching short. An ant is not going to stop me from doing my job. I stayed, I preached, I laid hands on people and suffered through for over one and a half hours. That's called pressure. Everybody says, oh, it's anointed, but <laughs> something is biting. <laughs> and after I finished preaching, shake people's hands you know everybody comes to see pastor and everything you know and and still suffer through it and i i was free i would look for it <laughs> oh i killed that thing i killed it with pleasure but i'm just telling you this that you may see it as honor but pressure is what produces great worth diamonds are produced out of pressure 
Nothing good comes by just saying, oh, I will be great. Oh, I will be what? So, yes, you are Elisha. You want a double portion, but you have to learn to go through what Elijah went through. And you have to go through a double to get the double portion. The disciples of Jesus, the mother of the disciples, uh, one, James and John, Jesus, you know, I want well, James here, I want John here in your kingdom. Jesus is fine. Fine. You want it? Fine. But you have to drink the cup. And you have to be baptized with the baptism. In other words, you have to go through what I go through to sit where I sit. It's good to dream. And fathers, listen, don't make life too easy for your children that they fail to pay the price for their own greatness. These days, there are too many dead about children all around. They have to learn to pay the price. Otherwise, your children will never get to the heights you got to. Life always favors the struggler. Life always favors. Don't ever forget that. Life always favors the struggler. The one who struggles, the one who wins. We got here through struggle. If our children don't struggle, they won't get to where we are. And those who struggle will get there. Life always favors the struggler. <laughs> last father. Last father. Philip. Philip. A father's influence. Philip is in the New Testament. He was one of the early deacons of the New Testament church. He shows us that fathers must not lose their families while gaining the world. Acts chapter 21 from verse 7 to 9. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemais, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Now this man had four daughters who, four virgin daughters who prophesied. I want you to note that verse 9. Four virgin daughters who prophesied. Philip is a very interesting person. He touched a city with the power of God in Acts chapter 8 from verse 5 to 8. He went to Samaria, preached Christ to them. Multitudes listened to him. Unclean spirits came out crying. Revival, salvation, a whole city. Samaria turned to Jesus because of Philip. That's a powerful man who is able to turn a city round. From there, he was led by the Spirit of God to go to the desert to meet a strategic influencer for Christ. And he led that person to Christ, the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter 8, from verse 26 to verse 30. If you look at Philip, you would say, wow, what an achiever. He's out there leading a city to Christ. He's out there leading a major political leader to Christ, which eventually took the gospel to a whole continent in Africa, the Ethiopian eunuch. That's great. He's a world changer. He's a world influencer. He's a world shaker, a mover, and a shaker. If you saw Philip, you'd say, What a man! What a man! What a man! But I feel that the greatest thing said about Philip is what we read in verse 9 of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 21. He had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Philip's children were morally and spiritually sound. The most critical testimony that in winning the world, he didn't lose his family. Because sometimes fathers work so hard to win the world and lose their own families. He won Samaria. He won 
public officials but his children never lost it they were virgins that talks about morality and they prophesied that spirituality they were morally and spiritually upright that's my word to every father don't be so busy losing, winning the world that you lose your family don't work so hard to get everybody that you lose your own children I tell my children I appreciate everything you do your education your accolades you know to go to events and see you graduate and collect prizes or be honored and so and so forth to see you work and do well and all of that but the greatest thing that will give me joy is not that it's, it's that you are Christians that you live for Christ that's all I want the rest is a bonus because what will be the prophet that I am known all over the world? Everybody says, oh, he's a great preacher. And my own children don't believe in what I believe in. Don't believe in the God I preach. Don't believe in the Jesus I talk about. And their lives are totally opposite everything I preach. That would be a pain to me. Philip somehow managed it perfectly big public ministry good private ministry don't be so bent on making it big that you lose your family I know children have their own mind and sometimes they will do crazy things that will make parents get shocked and no parent can guarantee a child's life. Nobody can do that. But all I'm saying is this. Don't be so focused on the world that you forget the home. For every man here who desires to be great and do something significant, that will be my prayer for you on this Father's Day. That you'll be a great achiever. You'll be a world changer. You'll be a mover in the world. The world will hear of you. You will move cities. You will move people. You will touch nations by your gift, by your products, by your abilities, by your, your services. That after you have done all of that, you can look at your family and say, Oh, thank God for my children. They didn't abandon my God. They worshiped my God. They are morally upright. They are spiritually strong. That should be your testimony. As a man. Now I know it's difficult. I know it's tough. I've raised four children. I know children have a mind of their own. Children have a mind of their own. When they're growing up, they always want to flex their space and expand their space and expand their liberties. And you trust God to help them to stay on track. It's only when they grow up that they say, Oh, Daddy, we are so happy for the way you brought us up. Meanwhile, they were fighting you throughout. But God expects us not just to win the world, but we must win the home too. We must win the home front. Philip is a good example. He won the world and won the home. And I pray that every man here, God will give you the grace to be like Abraham. You will win your battles. Whatever the battle is, whether it's for a child, whether it's against poverty, it's a health challenge. Whatever it is you are fighting, you will win it. And don't give up until you win that battle. And don't say, oh, it's time. I've struggled for too long. Abraham didn't waver. He stayed to the end. You will stay to the end and you will win that battle. And I pray that if 
Whatever God gives you as a family, you'll be a protector of the family, not the one who scatters the family. Not the one who allows the enemy to attack and dissipate and destroy your family. Your children will be protected. Your wife will be protected. Your home will be protected because you are there. Because you are there. Because you are anointed to protect. And I pray that God will make you like Elijah. That in you, your children will be greater than you. They will do double what you have done. They will go places you have never gone to. They will achieve what you could never achieve. May your children be greater than you. May your children achieve more than you. May your children rise to heights you have never risen. I've seen some women rising up to receive the prayer. God bless you too. Receive God's blessing. And I pray you be like Philip. That after all is said and done and the world is clapping for you and praising you, your home will be intact. Your home will be safe. Your home will be righteous. Your home will be an example of Christ. May the Lord bless you on this Father's Day. May he teach you to be a father. May he instruct you. May he order your steps. May he guide you. May he direct you even when you have made mistakes. May he forgive you and give you another chance to make it right. Your past mistakes will not sabotage your promise. You will not become a prisoner of your mistakes. You will rise above your mistakes. And you will set an example. Abraham rose above his mistakes. You will rise above your mistakes. In the name of Jesus, may the Lord cause every man here to be a true father after his heart. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give God praise, somebody.